Death has always been a mystery, a point where life and the unknown collide. Throughout history, different cultures have developed rituals to cope with this mystery. I'm looking for physical evidence of the cannibalism. I want to try and find the bones, the evidence that they actually do eat people. Some might seem strange to us today, but they all share a deep human desire to honor the dead and find meaning in their passing. Have you ever wondered about the unusual ways people around the world have said goodbye? Let's explore these fascinating and sometimes surprising death rituals together. Endocannibalism. Saying goodbye to a loved one is a deeply personal experience, and different cultures have developed unique ways to mourn. For some communities, the ultimate expression of respect involves a practice that might seem shocking to outsiders. It's called endocannibalism. Don't worry, this doesn't involve wandering hordes of zombies or post-apocalyptic wastelands. Endocannibalism refers specifically to the consumption of deceased members of your own community. Think of it as a very final family feast. Upon a person's passing, the tribe would gather for a grand celebration. The atmosphere would be one of mourning, yes, but also of remembrance and community. Everyone would contribute to a massive communal meal, and the centerpiece of this feast would be the recently departed. This wasn't about hunger or desperation. These feasts of the dead served a powerful purpose. By consuming the deceased, the community symbolically brought them back into the fold. It was a way to stay connected, to feel like the departed was still part of the tribe. The practice also served another practical purpose. It was a way to help people come to terms with death, to see it as a natural part of life. By openly preparing and consuming the body, the community showed that death wasn't something to fear, but rather a transition. Of course, this tradition might raise a few eyebrows in today's society. We tend to favor embalming fluids and floral arrangements over the whole eating your relatives thing. But cultures like the Melanesians of Papua New Guinea and the Wari people of Brazil saw it as a perfectly normal way to mourn. While endocannibalism might seem extreme, it sheds light on the universal human desire to find meaning and connection in the face of loss. Jewelry and Death Photography The Victorians lived in a time of great change. Trains rumbled across the land, bridges connected far-off places, and new ideas about society were taking root. But beneath the veneer of refinement lurked some rather curious customs, especially when it came to dealing with death. One such tradition was memorial jewelry, a way to keep your dearly departed close, even if it meant getting a little personal. Back then, there weren't any photos like we have today. So if someone you cared about died, you might take a piece of their hair and put it in a locket or weave it into a bracelet. This way, you could carry a part of them with you wherever you went. But the Victorians weren't known for half measures. For some, a simple lock of hair just wouldn't cut it. They went full on Adam's family. Teeth and even bone fragments of the deceased found their way into rings, brooches, and even cufflinks. Imagine adorning your sleeve with a miniature tibia. One wonders if grave robbing wasn't a booming black market during this period, considering the sheer amount of, well, skeletal bling Victorians seemed to favor. Thankfully, Technology marched on, bringing us photography in the later Victorian era. But with this new invention came an even more unsettling trend, posing with the deceased for a post-mortem portrait. Countless photos exist from this strange time, depicting families gathered around a dead relative, sometimes even propping them upright in a chair for the camera. While you could argue that these traditions were just an extension of the older practice of commissioning paintings of the deceased, there is something undeniably unsettling about them. Maybe it's the wide-eyed stare of the corpse, forever frozen in a moment of rigor mortis, or the unsettling calmness of the living relatives, seemingly unfazed by the situation. Whatever the reason, Victorian mourning customs offer a glimpse into a time when death was a more constant presence, and people dealt with it in ways that might raise a few eyebrows today. Sky Burials High atop the windswept plateaus of Tibet, a unique and fascinating funeral practice has endured for centuries. This tradition is known as sky burial, and it involves offering the deceased's body to the vultures of the Himalayas. For outsiders, it can be a sight that both intrigues and disturbs. The sky burials are steeped in tradition and deep Buddhist beliefs. Tibetan Buddhists, following the practice of ritual dissection or sky burial, don't see the body as something to be preserved. They view it as an empty vessel, no longer housing the consciousness that has moved on. So instead of entombing the deceased or turning them to ash, they choose a more natural and, dare we say, ecological approach. The body of the deceased is carefully brought to a designated site, often a high mountain peak with a breathtaking view. 
a specially trained sky burial practitioner, someone respected in the community, then performs the dissection. The remains are cut into small pieces, and in a gesture of generosity and respect for all living beings, they are offered to the vultures circling above. These birds are considered sacred by Tibetans, seen as nature's undertakers, ensuring the deceased returns to the ecological cycle. In fact, there is even a belief that vultures are drawn only to the pure of heart. Now there are also practical reasons why sky burials became so widespread in Tibet. The land itself plays a big role. Much of the Tibetan plateau is a harsh environment, with permafrost making digging graves nearly impossible. Additionally, the high altitude means trees are scarce, making traditional cremation out of the reach of many. Sky burials, then, became a practical and culturally significant way to lay loved ones to rest. Today, despite the introduction of modern burial and cremation options, over 80% of Tibetan Buddhists still choose the sky burial tradition. Sati Sati, a word that now evokes a sense of horror, was a once common practice in India. This horrific custom involved a recently widowed woman throwing herself onto her husband's funeral pyre and burning alive with him. Sati wasn't unique to India. Traces of this practice have been found in ancient cultures like the Egyptians, Greeks, and even Goths. The reasons why Sati began are shrouded in mystery, but some historians believe it stemmed from a complex web of beliefs. One theory suggests Sati emerged from a belief system where a wife was seen as an extension of her husband. In death, they were thought to be incomplete without each other, and Sati ensured their final journey to the afterlife would be undertaken together. Others speculate that it might have been a twisted way to stop wives from potentially murdering their husbands for inheritance. Whatever the reason, Sati was a barbaric act. Shockingly, the woman wasn't always a willing participant. In some cases, she was pressured, coerced, or even forced onto the pyre by others present at the funeral. Imagine the horrifying scene, a grieving widow, not given the space to mourn, but instead being condemned to a fiery death. The somber procession leading to the pyre wasn't a dignified farewell, but a grim spectacle, more similar to a witch hunt than a moment of respect. Thankfully, sati has been outlawed in India for a long time. However, the practice's shadow still lingers. In 1987, a village in Rajasthan witnessed a tragedy that exposed the horrifying reality of forced sati. An 18-year-old bride named Rup Kanwar, who had only been married eight months when her husband died, was pressured to commit sati. When she refused, a group of men from the village resorted to unthinkable cruelty. They drugged the young woman and then forced her onto her husband's funeral pyre, burning her alive. This horrific incident sparked national outrage and led to the creation of the Prevention of Sati Act. This law made it illegal to force or encourage a woman to commit sati, with the punishment for such crimes being death. Despite the law, isolated cases of sati have continued. Reports indicate that at least four such incidents occurred between 2000 and 2015. Finger Amputation Deep in the highlands of West Papua New Guinea, the Dani people have long grappled with grief in a very strange way. When a loved one passes away, it's not just emotional pain that washes over the family, but physical pain as well. Traditionally, Dani women and children who were close to the deceased would participate in a finger amputation ritual. This wasn't just a punishment, but a complex ritual with several purposes. For some Dani women, it was a way to appease the spirit of the deceased. They believed that by offering a part of themselves, they could calm the spirit and ensure a peaceful transition to the afterlife. Others saw it as a way to drive the spirit away, a physical act to sever the tie between the living world and the dead. But perhaps most profoundly, finger amputation was a way to express their grief. The intense physical pain mirrored the emotional pain of loss. It was a visible symbol of their suffering. The ritual itself was a harsh affair. Typically performed by a female elder of the tribe, a fingertip would be chopped off with a sharp stone tool, an ax, or even a knife. These weren't exactly surgical instruments, and the procedure was undoubtedly brutal. To stop the bleeding, the wound would then be cauterized with a hot stone or piece of burning metal. Imagine the excruciating pain, not just from the initial cut, but from the searing heat used to stop the blood flow. Incredibly, the Danny women endured this ordeal without complaint. The severity of the amputation depended on the closeness of the relationship. Losing a finger might signify the passing of a parent, while two fingers would be sacrificed for a child. Grief was further expressed through other physical means. Danny people would coat themselves in ashes and clay, 
the cold, gray dust a physical manifestation of their sorrow. Some women would even cut off a portion of their earlobe. For a week following the death, some Danny people would isolate themselves, smearing their bodies with river mud and foregoing bathing altogether. Thankfully, this tradition of finger amputation is no longer practiced in New Guinea. It has been banned due to the influence of modernization and the recognition of the physical and emotional toll it took on the women and children involved. However, the physical reminders of this past custom can still be seen on the hands of some older Danny people. The Mortuary Totem Poles of the Haida People Totem poles are iconic symbols of the Haida people in the Pacific Northwest coast, but these aren't just decorative centerpieces. They are windows into a rich cultural tradition surrounding death and the afterlife. Most Haida people practiced a form of communal burial. When someone passed away, their remains were placed in a large pit where they would decompose naturally, often aided by scavenging animals. This practice reflected the deep connection the Haida felt with the natural world, where death was seen as a return to the cycle of life. However, for high-ranking individuals like chiefs, shamans, or warriors, the send-off was a bit more, well, elaborate. These individuals were seen as vital threads in the fabric of the community, and their passing required a special kind of respect. Here is where the mortuary totem poles come in. The body of the deceased would undergo a unique preparation process. Using large wooden clubs, the body would be carefully crushed and pulverized until it fit into a small wooden box, roughly the size of a suitcase. This may seem shocking, but for the Haida, it was a way to ensure the deceased's spirit could properly enter the afterlife. The compact box would then be placed on a specially carved mortuary totem pole, which is erected prominently in front of the deceased longhouse. These mortuary poles served multiple purposes. First and foremost, they acted as guardians, watching over the spirit as it embarked on its journey to the afterlife. Secondly, the totem pole functioned as a kind of public monument. Its placement in front of the longhouse ensured it was visible to all who passed by, a constant reminder of the community's loss and the important role the deceased played. Early missionaries who encountered these mortuary poles were often struck by the strong odors emanating from them. This was a natural consequence of the unique burial practice. However, for the Haida people, the smell was a normal part of the grieving process. Famadihana, located off the southeastern coast of Africa, lies the island nation of Madagascar, a land teeming with unique cultures and traditions. The Malagasy people, the island's dominant ethnic group, hold a fascinating belief about death. They believe that the spirit of a loved one doesn't immediately depart after passing. As long as the body remains relatively intact, the spirit is considered to be close by, lingering in the world of the living. This belief has given rise to a remarkable custom known as Famadihana. According to Malagasy tradition, families have a responsibility to care for their deceased loved ones and ancestors until their spirits are fully ready to move on to the afterlife. This can take time, sometimes as long as several years. Famadihana serves as a way to bridge the gap between the living and the dead, a chance to show respect and continued love for those who have passed. Every five to seven years, typically during the dry winter months in Madagascar, families come together for this sacred ritual. Ancestral crypts are carefully opened and a reverent procession begins. Family members gently remove the burial cloths from their deceased relatives, treating the bodies with utmost respect. Fresh silk shrouds are then carefully wrapped around the bodies. The heart of Famadihana isn't a somber affair. It's a joyous celebration of life and the enduring connection between families. A grand feast is prepared, overflowing with delicious food to nourish the bodies and spirits of both the living and the dead. Lively music fills the air and people dance with enthusiasm. In some cases, families even dance with the bodies of their ancestors, a way to express their love and share their joy in a unique and meaningful way. Famadihana can last for up to two days. As the festivities wind down, the bodies are carefully returned to their crypts. In a symbolic gesture of closure, they are often placed upside down, signifying the completion of a life cycle and the peaceful transition into the afterlife. Gifts like money and even alcohol might be placed alongside them. The crypt is then sealed and the cycle begins anew, waiting for the next time families will gather to honor their ancestors in this extraordinary tradition. Subscribers pick. So far we have seen some of the most disturbing death rituals in human history, but today's image takes things to a whole new level of unsettling. 
we are looking at a clearly distressed woman bound to a crude wooden cross in the middle of a vast, empty field. But the real chill factor comes from the vultures surrounding her. They seem ready to strike. Now, the authenticity of this image is a complete mystery. It could be a staged scene, a historical reenactment, or something far more disturbing, a genuine glimpse into a forgotten burial ritual. The quality itself makes it difficult to discern if it's real or cleverly fabricated. So what do you think? Is this a horrifying historical practice or an elaborate hoax? Let us know your theories in the comments below. Blindfolding the deceased. If you think you have seen it all when it comes to funeral customs, then get ready to be surprised. Deep in the mountains of the Bengay province, nestled on the southern tip of the Philippine island of Luzon, lives a community with a unique way of honoring their dead. Here, death is not a solitary journey, but a chance for one last gathering with loved ones. When someone passes away in Bengay, their home transforms into a bustling center of activity. Friends and relatives from near and far begin to arrive, filling the house with a murmur of voices and shared memories. The body of the deceased is carefully cleaned and prepared. Then, several men embark on a specific task. They gather strong bamboo poles and set about constructing a special chair. This isn't any ordinary chair. It's the deceased's final throne, a place of honor where they will sit and be remembered during the mourning period. The body is then gently but firmly secured in the bamboo chair using additional strips of cloth. This isn't just for stability, it also has a deeper meaning. They believe the deceased shouldn't have to witness the suffering of the world they left behind, so they are blindfolded with a piece of cloth. A fire is then lit near the body, serving a dual purpose. The flames act as a deterrent to insects, keeping the body preserved for as long as possible. More importantly, the fire serves as a beacon, a guiding light in case the deceased's spirit wanders during this transitional phase. They believe the fire will help them find their way back home if they become lost. This period lasts for eight days. As you might imagine, with the passage of time, the body begins to decompose. But for the Bengay people, it isn't a source of fear or disgust. They approach death with a pragmatic acceptance and even a touch of humor. They may make jokes about the smell, a way to lighten the mood during this difficult time. They even continue to interact with the deceased, offering them alcoholic drinks during celebratory meals, a final toast to a life well lived. The night before the burial, a special ceremony takes place. Elders come together to deliver a special eulogy, not written on paper, but chanted in a rhythmic, almost musical way. This oral tradition ensures that the memory of the departed will live on within the community. Finally, the day of the burial arrives. As the body is laid to rest, mourners come together in a unique ritual. They strike bamboo sticks together. In their belief, this rhythmic noise helps guide the deceased's spirit on its journey to the afterlife. It's a final act of love and support, a way to ensure their loved one doesn't get lost on the path to heaven. Buried under the kitchen. Still in the Philippines, but far north of the Bengay people, live the Izneg, an indigenous group with a fascinating tradition for burying their dead. Their customs have been passed down for generations and continue to be an important part of their culture. When someone in the Izneg community dies, there are specific rituals that must be followed before burial. First, the body is carefully washed with water. This cleansing ceremony is believed to remove any dirt or impurities and prepare the deceased for their journey to the afterlife. The Izneg place great importance on clothing, and this extends to their funeral practices. After washing the body, family members will dress the deceased in their finest attire. There's a special significance to this. The Izneg believe that ancestral spirits recognize their loved ones by the clothes they wear in the afterlife. Once these preparations are complete, the community is informed about the death. This is a time for gathering and sharing memories of the deceased. A special feast is prepared, with offerings of food presented to honor the departed. In some cases, there may also be animal sacrifices, a tradition with deep roots in Izneg culture. But what truly sets the Izneg burial custom apart is the final resting place. Unlike many cultures that bury their dead in cemeteries, the Izneg choose a much more personal location, under the kitchen floor of the deceased's home. This may seem surprising to outsiders, but for the Izneg, it's a way to keep their loved ones close, even in death. Before the body is placed under the kitchen floor, there's a final farewell ceremony. Family members gather around, sharing stories and expressing their grief. The body may even be symbolically warmed by a fire. Once the goodbyes are said, 
the deceased is carefully laid to rest beneath the kitchen floor. The Izneg burial ceremony ends with a unique ritual. Stones are thrown against the walls of the house. This isn't an act of anger or aggression. It's a way to ward off evil spirits and ensure the peaceful passage of the deceased into the afterlife. The Izneg believe that by driving away any malevolent forces, they can create a safe space for their loved one's spirit to begin its journey. Burial Custom of the Aboriginal People We have seen some of the most disturbing death rituals in human history, but here is one that might take the cake for uniqueness. This comes from the Aboriginal people of Australia, who have a complex and fascinating set of beliefs about death and the afterlife. When a family member passed away, the body would be carefully placed on a raised platform, constructed from sturdy branches and logs. Then, it would be covered with a layer of leaves and branches, creating a natural tomb. Over the following months, nature would take its course. The body would decompose, slowly returning to the earth. During this time, some Aboriginal groups had a very interesting practice. They believed that the deceased spirit remained connected to their body, and even more, that their good qualities and wisdom could be passed on. So they would carefully collect some of the liquids produced during decomposition and rub them onto the bodies of young men in the tribe. It was a way to symbolically transfer the strength knowledge and good character of the deceased to the next generation. Once the decomposition process was complete, the remaining bones were carefully collected. These weren't just discarded, they were treated with reverence. An important part of the ritual involved painting the bones with red ochre, a natural pigment with symbolic meaning in Aboriginal cultures. Red ochre is often associated with life, the earth, and the spirit world. Painting the bones with ochre was a way to honor the deceased and prepare them for their next journey. So, what happened to the bones after they were painted? There wasn't just one answer. In some cases, the bones would be placed in a special cave, a sacred place believed to be a gateway to the spirit world. Other times, they might be carefully placed inside a hollowed out log, creating a portable resting place for the deceased. Here's where things get even more interesting. Some Aboriginal groups believed that carrying the bones of a loved one served as a powerful connection. For up to a year, they might carry these specially prepared bones with them, close to their bodies. It was a way to keep their loved one close, even in death, and to ensure their safe passage into the afterlife. There were also some Aboriginal groups with stricter customs. They might refuse to speak the name of the deceased after their death, a way to avoid disturbing their spirit. Additionally, any property the deceased owned might be completely abandoned, ensuring they weren't tethered to the material world in the afterlife. The overall goal of these Aboriginal death rituals was to ensure a smooth transition for the deceased. By allowing the body to decompose naturally, collecting the bones, and treating them with respect, they believed they were helping their loved ones on their journey to the spirit world. Coffins on the cliffside. In the Philippines, high up in the mountains of Sagada, there's a unique tradition that's been practiced for over 2,000 years. It's not a party, but a fascinating way the Sagada people care for their deceased loved ones. Instead of burying them underground, they place them in coffins that are then hung high on cliff sides. Imagine looking out over a lush green valley and spotting these wooden boxes suspended precariously on the rock face. It's an attention-grabbing sight, and there's a deep meaning behind this custom. The Sagada people believe that the closer a person's spirit is to the sky, the easier their journey will be to the afterlife. They envision the spirit climbing up to heaven, and by placing the coffin high on a cliff, they're giving their loved one a head start. There is another layer to this tradition. The Sagada people believe in spirits called Anito that can influence the living world. By placing the coffin high up, they hope the Anito will be well positioned to bring good luck and fortune to the living family members below. There is also a practical reason behind this tradition, rooted in a bygone era. Years ago, the region was plagued by headhunters who would take the heads of their enemies as trophies. By placing their dead high on cliffs, the Sagada people ensured their loved one's bodies wouldn't be disturbed. The Sagada people also have specific rituals surrounding death. There is a period of mourning or vigil that lasts for several days, a time for family and friends to come together and share memories of the deceased. Then comes the procession to the cliffside. Carrying the body to the coffin is seen as an honor, and some believe it can even bring good luck and even transfer some of the deceased's skills to those who carry them. An interesting detail to note is the size of the coffins. They're quite small, and that's because the bodies are carefully positioned inside in a fetal position. In some cases, 
The bones might even be cracked slightly to allow them to fit. The coffin is then sealed with strong vines, ready to be placed on its final resting place high on the cliffside. Thank you for watching this video. See you in the next one.